People who escape death by complete luck share their stories. While whitewater rafting, my raft was going through rapids when I got ejected from the raft and sent underwater. I swam up and hit my helmet on a rock. It was pretty dark and murky. That is when I realized that I had been pushed by the current either underneath a rock outcrop or into an underwater cave. I'm not really sure which. Trying my best not to panic, I did the only thing I could think of, use my hands to grip the rock and push myself against the current while kicking. After what felt like an eternity underwater, but it was probably no more than about two or three minutes, I noticed the light was getting brighter, and before I knew it, I had reached the surface. Once at the surface, the current of the rapids shot me downstream, and I floated to the nearest bank of the river to collect myself. Car accident, moped versus Oldsmobile. I was the mope driver. A straight road car turns from the oncoming lane across traffic. Being a newish motorcycle driver, moped, I knew enough to know I was fucked. But instead of putting it down, turning, or anything, I took my hands off the steering and wrapped my head as I impacted, no helmet, inverting both knees on the handlebars, and breaking the key off inside. My right knee and the dislocation of my right shoulder as I spun into the windshield, shattering the windshield, and dislocating my hip on the concrete. My ignorance saved my life. A seasoned rider would have put the bike down and likely been run over. And my taking the hands off the steering saved my fingers, my head and neck, to an extent, and my shoulder, my right arm was the arm that wrapped my head first, and the impact dislocation would have been my head if I hadn't. The impact speed was 50 miles per hour. Not a single bone was broken, but I permanently fucked my back. And realistically, I should be dead. Three times come to mind for me. First, a drunk driver going 100 miles per hour plus hit my vehicle. They were coming down the wrong side of the highway that late evening. I swerved and woke up on the floor of my truck. Second, when working in a restaurant, glasses come straight out of the dishwasher. I grabbed two out of the rack for a table, and one sheared at the base, fell, and hit my wrist. Three tourniquets at different spots on my arm later, they were able to stop the bleeding. I was wearing a watch with a metal band, and that stopped the glass from cutting further. Third, I found out I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. The doctor said another two to three months without treatment, and I'd have been dead. I finished chemo last month and am in remission. Anyone know a good gift for their guardian angel? Mine has been working overtime. I was driving on an interstate approaching an interchange when I saw several cop cars racing the wrong way at me down the ramp. I was so focused on where they were going to go and how I could get out of their way that I didn't see the car that was running from them barreling at me in the left lane. Thankfully, I chose the right shoulder and didn't get in the left lane, or I would have been hit head on. I watched in horror behind me as that car ended up crashing into a semi that tried moving to the left shoulder to avoid him. Had I been just a few seconds later or gotten in that lane to avoid the cops, that would have been me. As if the crash itself wouldn't have been bad enough, I was in a tiny early 90s Mazda MX-3, and I know I would have only been wearing a shoulder belt because that car had automatic seat belts and I didn't use the lap belt back then. It would have been my last day for sure. I have no idea what pushed my wheel to the right side, but I'm lucky it did. Driving at night on a dark, small back road with trees on both sides. With me were three ladies, who were just telling me that these roads were so dangerous because this time of year farmers come bolting down roads with their heavy who needs lights, YOLO machinery. In the corner of my eye, between the trees, I see a little reflector. The reflector is low to the ground, but suddenly I realize it is moving towards the road I am on, and I break the car in reflex. Next thing I know, I have to break completely because this gigantic, dark, unlit tractor trailer turns on the road in a hurry. Nobody in the car realized it was there, and we were all scanning that side road as we were just talking about the danger. If I had continued driving, I would have driven the car into that thing without knowing what happened to me. It reminds me of my colleagues in Africa, who keep telling me I should stop worrying about the trucks you can see coming towards you and start worrying about the trucks you cannot see coming your way. Walking through a Dutch town at old age, I heard a loud bang and, 15 centimeters next to my head, a large metal traffic sign stuck in the wall, which somebody blew off a pole 25 meters away. On a holiday with a huge hangover, me and a friend decided to swim to the pizzeria on the other side of a 3 kilometer wide lake. Halfway through, we were both completely exhausted and very much undercooled, with large purple spots appearing on our bodies. And when we started to be convinced that we'd die, a random tourist in a small fishing boat appeared and took us in. I fell 9 meters down at work but landed in the only sandpile due to construction work on the rest of the concrete floor. I was sliding with the bike on a wet road, went under a bus from the side 
and came out in the back without hitting anything. I should be dead. This was years ago, but I still get shivers over it. I was in the army, deployed to the Gulf. We had a short hump back of about 20 kicks, but I had hurt my knee the previous day falling from a 113 trying to pee on someone, separate story. Anyway, they needed someone to drive a deuce and a half full of water bottles to another unit, offload, and take all their trash. I volunteered just to get out of the road march. Make the drive and start the swapping process. Get finished, and the other guy's truck is full of boxes of water and mine trash bags. I'm completely full, but there is one bag left. He tried and tried to get it in, but there was just no room, so I told him, dude, you just have to keep that one. He tossed it in the back of his, and we started to leave. About 10 seconds after we pulled away, we heard and felt the explosion. We are fine, but the other truck is just mangled. It turns out some asshat had picked up what we guess was a bomblet from a cluster bomb and put it in the trash. It was in that last bag. The other two guys in the truck were pretty shaken, but the water absorbed most of the blast. Had that last bag made it onto my truck, I wouldn't be here today. I have a bad habit of narrowly missing dying or being severely maimed while hiking. I do a lot of bushwhacking, and I have had two instances where I was inches from being straight killed by a falling tree. The first one was extra spooky. Me and some friends stopped to take a break, and we were using a fallen tree that was still attached to the trunk, making a right angel. My friends sat in the tree while I stupidly sat under it in the triangle. We hung out for maybe 15 minutes, then got up to keep going. Right as we started walking away, the tree fell all the way to the ground, right where I had been seconds before, and that tree was easily big enough to kill me. Another big tree missed me by inches when I lightly bumped it, and the top fell off. Last fall, I was stepping over a log, and the ground gave way under me, and I fell about 6 inches. I was standing directly over a sharp branch pointed right at my groin. If I fell another 2 inches, I would have been in a lot of pain, 3 inches, and that sucked, would have impaled me in the groin. Lots of hiking. I always tell myself I'm going to be extra careful from now on, and then I end up having another way too close call before long. I lived in the attic of an apartment in an old Victorian house. I kept hearing noises in the walls until one night I woke up to a room full of bats. Needless to say, I didn't want to live in an apartment infested with bats, so some friends of mine said I could live in their extra room. I moved really quickly because of bats. Ugh. Anyway, two days later, the entire old Victorian house went up in flames and burned to the ground. I thought, phew, I got out of there just in time. But that wasn't the end of it. A few days after that, some detectives showed up on campus where I had class and asked to speak with me. They started asking me all these questions about whether or not I knew this guy who lived in the basement of the old house. I explained that I may have said hi in passing a few times, but that was it. Well, it turns out that the guy was obsessed with me, he moved into the basement of the building because I lived there, and he freaked out and set the fire when I left because he didn't know where I went. I had no idea. They found a bunch of pictures of me and all kinds of creepy stuff in his belongings. Luckily, no one was hurt in the fire, and he went to prison for arson, which carries a stiffer penalty than stalking. I love bats now. Bats are my friends. Thank you, bats. Not sure if this counts, but I had just gotten a new car in my last year of college after my prior one had been totaled a month prior by an impaired driver t-boning me, also in a near-death experience. I got a little lip spoiler to put on the trunk that came in the day before, but I didn't have time to put it on. This day, I got up early for church so I could put it on before I went. I left to go to church, and everything was fine initially. Things changed when I got on the freeway flyover, I think it's called, basically a big ramp that curves at the apex and then brings you back down. As I was climbing and just about to hit the curved part of it, I lost complete control of my car. I was swerving left, right, and heading straight for the barricade, not speeding but probably fast enough to either eject me from the seat, plummeting to my death, the seatbelt was on, or give me very serious injuries. I did everything I could, slam on the brakes, try to counter the steering, and I even reached for the handbrake that I couldn't find. I ended up correcting the steering and coming to a stop just before I hit the barrier. I evened out and rode the flyover down to where it was level and pulled over to the side to collect myself as I was shaking and hyperventilating. To this day, I remember the car that was right behind me passing me and the expression on the face of the lady in the passenger seat after what just transpired. I have been close to death four times. First time I was born. I literally shot out of my mom, and the midwife only managed to catch me before I hit the floor. The second time was when I was around eight or nine. I fell from one of those raised sand pens. I landed in a way that should have broken my neck, because, in theory, 
I could not have landed beneath the large tree trunk right beside it without hitting the back of my head on it. Third time I was skiing. I lost control of my skis on a mountain and went off course. I hit a tree really hard. If I hadn't been stopped by that tree, I would have tumbled over the edge and fallen down the mountain. The fourth time was when I gave birth to my stillborn son. An hour or so after giving birth, I started bleeding a lot and was rushed to the operating room. I had a near-death experience of drowning when I was a child. My dad was tossing me gently up in the air so I'd have a little splash in my aunt's pool, and I kept shouting higher. Like any kid would. But my dad is not a good dad, so the last time he did it, I remember being tossed high enough that I could see the roof of my aunt's house, and in the free fall, I had time to think, this is going to hurt, I'm sorry, daddy. I didn't feel the impact, and I woke up under the water, but it was wrong. I could breathe the water, it was infinite instead of being able to see the walls and touch them after two strokes, and it was dozens of feet deep instead of the three feet it was designed to be. I swam and swam, thinking I was a mermaid and yet aware I was probably dead, because I knew even by then he'd kill me someday, so why be upset he succeeded? Probably better for me. I don't know how long it felt like, an hour? But eventually a big light was seen above me and asked me if I wanted to stay or go, and I said go because I didn't want to be alive with my family. But for some reason, I backed down and swam to the surface, and it was so hard that I almost didn't make it anyway. When I broke the surface, I was visibly drowning and flailing, but I managed to force myself to vomit and cough out the water by sheet panic, as all my dad did was smack my back a few times while my aunts and grandma yelled at me for ruining the water. I got tossed out onto the gravel and took myself inside, and that was it. Still here, I guess, so there must be a reason for it. Back when I was a year or two out of high school, I was riding around town with three girlfriends. We were looking for one of our guy friends to see if he wanted to smoke with us. We hadn't found him yet, and we were sitting at a red light, heading east. The light turned green, and then my friend who was driving said, Oh, is that him at the gas station? We all turn and look to see if it's him, and then we realize it wasn't, so my friend starts to go straight, just as a semi, heading north, blows through the red light. If my friend had gone as soon as the light turned green, we would have been T-boned, and probably all four of us would have died. Definitely the two on the passenger side. I think about that every now and then. I was boogie boarding in 10-15 foot surf at high tide. I saw a wave I wanted, as did another surfer, and we raced to get priority position, and I was late. A 12 footer crashed on my head and sent me to the bottom, which had happened hundreds of times in my life. But this time, while being tossed like a rag doll underwater, my boogie board and leash had wrapped around my legs twice and pinned my left arm to my side. I couldn't kick or use my dominant arm to swim, but it really didn't matter as the wave tosses you so much that you don't know which way is up. The wave was holding me down, and since it was high tide, I couldn't feel the bottom. I was running out of air and beginning to panic. I suddenly had a moment of clarity and said to myself, if you don't calm down, you're going to die. I relaxed and let the wave take me. What felt like a split second later, I felt one of my fins on my foot hit sand and say, the bottom. I rocketed out of the water and took the biggest breath of air that was the saltiest breath of life. I climbed over the boulders overlooking the spot, shaking terribly, not because I was cold but realizing I had survived. I sat there with my board for about 15 minutes, watching some really good waves on a military base called Point Mugu. There was hardly anybody there, four of us, at one of the best surf spots on the entire west coast. After calming down, I thought to myself, the surf is hardly this good and big. I grabbed my board, launched off the rocks, and rode a few more waves as the sun set. The most recent one was pure luck in a freak accident. I was cutting trim for our house using a miter saw on a beautiful, clear day in the middle of COVID. No wind or clouds present, but high humidity. I went to make my last cut, but my glasses fogged up. I removed my safety glasses so I wouldn't amputate my thumb. The blade spun up, I lowered it to cut, a wind appeared, and I blew a previous offcut into the spinning blade. The blade picked up the offcut and flung it into my right eye at 140 miles per hour. The piece carries the same kinetic energy as a right hook from Mike Tyson. Thankfully, the face of the piece that pushed my eye back was 5 mm too big in both directions to fully enter my eye socket. The hospital was fucking useless, except for the one eye doctor who skillfully removed what he could from my eyeball. I never saw a nurse, general practitioner, neurologist, etc. No medicine or head injury examination was given. I got literally dumped on the sidewalk after the material got pulled from my eye. Fuck you of M. It took me 30 days to be able to see light, 12 weeks for my pupil to return to a normal-ish size, and 12 months for my eye to eject the last piece of wood. 
It took three years for my brain to function fully again. I should have just cut my thumb off. I was sitting in the back seat of a 1981 Chevy Citation, completely still at a red light, with no seat belt on. A semi hit us at 60 to 70 miles per hour, and all four of us walked away. I had 13 stitches in the back of my head. I have three fun theories. One, I am just too hard-headed. Two, heaven doesn't want me and hell is afraid I will take over. Or three, you cannot keep a good man down. The odds are a mix of one and two. I have also been held at gunpoint with a 40 caliber gun to the chest. I got out of that by fighting crazy with crazy. I finally reached up, pushed the gun harder into my chest, and asked my ex if she thought that was going to get rid of me. She laughed and said she knew it would. I laughed and said, no, I will be right back. I will make a deal with the first devil I see. It stunned her so much that she lowered the gun. I took it and left. I sat in my car for 15 minutes or so, just shaking. She was untreated bipolar, and I really thought I was going to die. The crazy statement I made at the end was just a last second Hail Mary to see if it would work. Fainting in the hospital saved my life. If I had been anywhere else, I would have died. I was even on the same door as the ICU, where they took me afterwards. I was in the hospital because it was two to three days after having super invasive surgery to remove a tumor from the inside of my spinal cord. They'd worked on my C4 C7, and I will always have an incomplete spinal cord injury. Anywho, my left side was numb all over, and I couldn't move anything. I'd just gotten my arm to move that morning, but I still couldn't use my hand. I had to pee, and we discovered it started my period in the midst of the chaos, so the lovely CNAs ran over to maternity and brought me back some of those mesh disposable afterbirth pants with the pads made into them, as numb as my junk was, they were comfy. It felt like always brand infinity flex foam pads in the light blue box. I have no kiddos, but mamas, if y'all want comfy periods, I recommend those pads. They had me on this weird sitting walker that had handles like an elliptical machine and a little gate that closed under your butt, and you basically wall squat in this thing. Took me to the bathroom, got me leaning forward and kind of standing, we're cleaning up, I'm helping with my good arm, and the dizzy hits as they're pulling the pants up over my ass. I remember her saying, oh no. Can you stand up as straight as you can and try to lean a little to the right? You're crooked and leaning, honey. So I did. She asked me if I felt better. I nodded yes but said, but I can't hear anything. The next thing I know, three ladies are holding me, and one says, you passed out a little. Then I was on the bed, and the nurse was doing chest compressions with one hand and reaching for the code button with the other. I just stared until she noticed me, then we both started crying, and she was freaking out, apologizing, while I was freaking out, thanking her and hugging her with my good arm. I was surrounded by doctors and hadn't realized it because I was so out of it. I was taken to the ICU at 4.30 am and spent four days there, until my heart finally got a little stronger, the spinal shock wore off, and I could safely be upright. That was seven years ago. I can walk, and my left hand works decently, but it's still numb and probably always will be. I get dizzy at least once a day, but I just sit down and let it ride until I can get back up again. I have PTSD from the injury and hospital stay, but I'm grateful to be alive. I think about that night a lot. Especially when I do things we didn't think I'd ever be able to do again. Dear everyone with an SCI who is not mobile, I do it for you. Driving my moped home from school at 9 p.m., I'd worked all day, I was a plaintiff personal injury paralegal at the time and collected and wrote settlement letters to insurance companies. I was dreaming about making mac and cheese when I got home when suddenly I heard a very loud noise. I remember thinking, oh SHT, this is bad, I'm not getting that mac and cheese tonight, and then waking up on my back on the street in front of Straub Hospital, where two night workers who didn't speak English were trying to help me by gathering my shoes that blew off. My skirt was over my ass. I had a headache so huge, um. Ambulance came and took me to Queen's Medical Center, I don't know why not Straub, I was literally 50 feet from their doorway. A man who had gotten a weekend pass from the psych ward took his brother's taxi cab but didn't take his antipsychotic meds. He said he got dizzy while driving and rear-ended me when he swerved into my lane. He panicked and hit and ran. He ended up at a gas station a few miles away, stopped to get gas, and someone there saw the basket from the back of my moped that was crunched and connected to the grill of the car, that had all my personal information, and his windshield was cracked. Police showed up because they were looking for a car at that point. I got so lucky, the windshield still had my hair and skin stuck to it, lol, and I was seriously bruised up. My neck hurt, and my low back from my basket hit it before I rolled over the car and landed on my back. I guess I have a thick, ropey scar on the back of my head where it hit the street. Doc sewed it up without numbing it, 
That hurt like fuck. But no broken bones, I made a pretty quick recovery and was back at work part time within a week, using a cane for my fucked right knee. I still have scars on my knees and knuckles from the road rash, my neck still bugs me, and my right knee swells when it's going to rain. But I got off lucky. It could have ended up so bad. My firm worked out a nice settlement with his insurance company, and I got to transfer to a better college. In 2014, I was doing this project of documenting and writing up Canadian military monuments. I grew up in Ottawa but moved to the GTA and hadn't been back in a while. There was a Leafs game in Ottawa, and I was going to use that as a reason to drive up, stay with a friend, and photograph the cenotaph and tomb of the unknown soldier in downtown Ottawa. It was a perfect arrangement because my friend worked at the bank right across the street from the memorial. I was going to drive him to work and do some photography first thing in the morning. On the day of my trip, I wake up absolutely sick as fuck. I was unable to even get out of bed. It was so bad. I called my friend, cancelled, and just gave him my tickets to the hockey game. The morning I was going to be there, a guy went on a shooting spree and murdered one of the honor guards at the war memorial I was going to visit. The timing of my trip and my driving my friend to work would have put me there at exactly that moment. It took a while for me to reconcile the fact that my life could be very different or over if I had not gotten sick that morning. Conversely, if I had been there, could I have seen him coming, and the outcome would have been different? I don't know. I was walking to school after waking up late and was in a rush while crossing the road. I saw out the corner of my eye that the light to my left was red, and I couldn't hear a car, so I just thought it was safe. But I had my earphones in and didn't look up to see the absolute dickhead doing 60 miles per hour down a main road, running the red light. But at the same time, I got a message and took a second to read it before I stepped off the island to cross. I was maybe half a second late to being turned into meat paste. On the same road at the same light, I grabbed someone when they were about to do pretty much the same thing and stopped them from walking out in front of a bus running the light. I fucking hate Manchester Road. But people also need to get off their phones while walking around. Please be aware of your surroundings. I was in ROTC in college and at a field training exercise. That night we were doing nighttime land, navigating through the woods. At some point, we heard loud, echoey cracking. Suddenly, something hit my shoulder hard enough to stun me, and I yelled. There was also a huge crash next to me. My group freaked out and swiveled their flashlights in my direction. Because, apparently, they thought I'd been squashed by a huge tree that fell. I didn't see it fall, but they sure did. Lo and behold, there was a downed tree next to me. I guess I got hit by falling tree bits or something when it was on the way down, but not by the tree itself. But the group was so rattled that the senior cadet NCO who was in charge of us completely forgot how to read a map from that point on. The other cadets kept asking if I was okay. Eventually, I had to take a point and finish the exercise with these guys lumbering after me the entire time, asking if I was sure I was okay. Afterwards, we checked in with our cadre, and they just all simultaneously told that poor captain and master sergeant that I'd almost been killed by a tree. The captain just went, my name, almost got taken out by a tree, and your team was still the first back? Good hustle. LOL. I have my own story and a story of my mom's and one of my dad's. I can't know for sure if it would have killed me, but as a kid, I was taking a bath, and for some reason I scooted forward a bit, when suddenly a very heavy ceramic air vent fell down exactly where my head would have been. When my mom was a kid, she was sunbathing on her grandma's lawn when she suddenly got this stabbing pain in her tummy and ran to her grandma. A few seconds later, a truck filled with gravel came crashing down from the hill above and ran right over the blanket my mom had been lying on. When I was like four, my dad worked as a postman. I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but in their cars, the driver seated on the right side instead of the left, so they have easy access to mailboxes. He was driving one day, probably way too fast because he always does, and hit ice. The car hit the ditch and flew in the air, hitting a tree, smashing the entire left side of the car. Had he driven a normal car, he would be very dead now. Did he learn his lesson? Nope. I got stabbed to death in Edmonton, Alberta, while drunk and high off of mushrooms after the 2019 Halloween howler. I got seven stabs in the back while I was busy fighting with someone else after getting jumped after the party. All the punctures were very deep, and on the upper left-hand side, close to the spine and the heart, the doctor said it's a miracle that the knife didn't hit my heart or spine, and the investigator said the scene where it happened was the bloodiest he had ever seen in his 23 years on the force. I got away or they stopped chasing me, and once I stopped, I got dizzy and tired and passed out under the streetlights in the neighborhood of Laurel. I woke up in the hospital the next morning after surgery. 
Someone in the neighborhood found me and called the ambulance. It was like three in the morning in a quiet and isolated neighborhood, who found me or how they found me, I'll never know. Died in the back of the ambulance and had to be resuscitated. I lost so much blood that the DR said if I had laid there for five more minutes, I wouldn't have been able to survive. Since then, I've gotten away from gang life, met a woman who loves me as much as I love her, had a child together, and gotten myself sober. My airbag and seatbelt. It broke my ribs, and the airbag broke my face, but I lived. I was a passenger and caught the impact of a cement median on a curved interstate at night in hail. Hydroplaning spin and caught the second impact as well on the spin. I got out of the car through the passenger window, walked into the ambulance, and laid down, jokingly, with no pain. They looked at me like they saw a ghost. She told me I'm lucky to be alive. Once we pulled into the ER, the pain hit me like bricks landing on my chest, all the left side ribs were broken, and one corner of a clavicle broke off and lodged itself under my left breast. I've got a fun bump there now. I barely escaped a lung puncture by half an inch. My seatbelt also left a nice little laceration on the side of my neck. My face recovered fast as fuck, I had a broken nose and a sprained jaw. Other than raccoon eyes for a few months, I'm fine. Nine years later, I still have a bruise that shows up when I'm sick or exhausted, right under my left eye. Broken ribs suck, BTW. It ain't shit they can do for you. I had a cold that got to bronchitis three months after the accident, and let me tell you. Misery. But hey, I survived. They still hurt whenever the weather is bad. I was having drinks with one of my friend's friends at the local mart. Then we decided to go home, and eventually a friend that I knew had gone back before us that just met for the first time and we were staying a bit later. Unfortunately, after that, he decided to drop me home. As I remember at that time, I don't have drive since after having a talk about our home, his and mine are near each other, so I decided each other, so I decided to let him drop me home, and this is what's happening when on the way home he crashes into the median and I'm in a motorcycle with him. After I wake up, he's already gone. The lucky thing is that he's the driver and wears a helmet, as I remember and I don't, and I can't remember what the speed was on that night. The thing is, I was horribly injured and lost one of my eyesight, plus I stayed in the hospital for almost two months. The most cruel moment of my life is that we decided to start our friendship and shake hands a lot before we decided to go home, which has been a traumatic event in my life until now.